Okay, for those of you that are that are visiting, or if you're not super familiar with how Beloved operates, uh, this is normally the message. What um, is is part of our DNA, part of our vision, part of our mission for uh, what we're called to do. But this Sunday, you are going to participate in what I'm calling a family meeting. So welcome to the family. We're going to have a family meeting. The, um, if you have a, a strong-willed father like I did, usually family meetings meant that dad talked the whole time, so I'm going to play dad, and I'm going to talk the whole time. But we're actually having a family meeting, so this isn't as much of a message. But don't check out. Didn't Dennis just say that you stay in the spirit? Okay, there are going to be incredible, some of the most transform, transforming revelations that I've ever had are going to be a part of this. And so if you're, if you're coming at it from just a, a mental point of view, you're going to miss a ton, a ton, a ton of really powerful things that the Holy Spirit has for you. So I don't want you to do that. There's also a couple of things that I want to say to preface this. This is going to be generally about beloved. But a lot of the things that we're going to talk about here, there are going to be applications to your marriage. Because believe it or not, the, uh, the dynamic that takes place here on Sunday morning from pastor to flock is almost like husband to wife. Um, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 that the, the church is his bride and he's the groom. And it's not applying some kind of a, a sexualized thing to that or some kind of a gender thing to that. What he's saying is, is that the relationship between the church and Christ should be a healthy relationship in the same way that a wife is uh, in relationship with her husband and the husband with the wife. So I'm not saying that I'm the guy and I'm the groom and you're the bride. I'm saying that there is a dynamic that is, uh, that is a comparable to a marriage relationship that takes place in the church between the pastor and the congregation. But this is not only going to be applicable t between you and I. There is going to be massive amounts of applications to marriages to relationships that you have with coworkers, from um, boss to employee or employee to boss, from um, parents to children, children to parents, grandparents, any dynamics of relationships that you are currently in, there is going to be uh, a boatload of applicable things that are going to be shared and discussed and revealed through the anointing of the Holy Spirit in today's message. So I want you to open up your heart this is going to be one of those times I'm going to say, like, I really, you know, normally I'm like, I want you to open your heart. I want you to receive. I want you to open your heart and your mind today. And I know for some of you, I just, I just messed you up. You can actually use both. And it's okay. They work together. God, God made them that way. And we think that you check out a one to get into the other. Family meeting, 2020. The art of communication is the language of leadership. Every person in this room is a leader, whether you like it or not, whether you know it or not. There are people that you are influencing. Leadership is influence. You are influencing people every day. The greatest way that you can preach the gospel is with your lifestyle. The most obtrusive thing that you could do to the gospel is have a lifestyle contrary to Christ. Uh, any, any Jew, any uh, uh, Orthodox Jew would tell you that the greatest commandment in the Ten Commandments is thou shalt not take the Lord thy God to name in vain. In American, in our, in our Greek way of thinking, what we think is don't cuss in Jesus' name. That is not what that means. Taking the name of God in vain means that you are, there are things that are in your life that are vanity, that are worthless, that makes other people see that the name, the character, the nature, the honor, and the value that God has based upon you and your lifestyle has just been diminished or destroyed. That's taking the name of the Lord thy God is in vain. Or, for example, 
I am going to punch you in the face in Jesus' name. That would be taking the name of the Lord in vain because I would be doing something contrary to the nature of God in his name. The greatest way for you to preach the gospel is with your lifestyle. If people that know you don't know that you are a spirit-filled, Jesus-loving, wheels-off Christian, maybe the gospel's not important. And I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad. I'm just, it's just a reality. You didn't have to ask Jesus if he was a Christian. <laughs> you, didn't have to, you didn't have to ask anybody if they thought he was a Christian. It was, it was everywhere. You didn't have to ask anybody if you thought Paul was there or Peter. Or, most of the time they were trying to get him to settle down. I, I would, it, would, it would do my heart much, uh, much joy to have to come to you and say, hey, now, settle down your witness a little bit. You're, you're, you're freaking people out. You're representing Beloved out there. You know, if you're going to freak people out, don't wear your Beloved t-shirt and hat. I would much rather do that than to stand up here and say, could you please tell someone about Jesus? Does Jesus mean anything? One of the saddest stats that you'll probably ever hear in your entire life is that only 2% of people in evangelical churches, evangelical churches, only 2% of people in evangelical churches have personally led someone to Jesus. That to be able to walk by people every day, to work with people every day, to even have friends that you say that you appreciate and you love, and you do not help them secure their eternity, I, I, I don't know. I honestly don't know what could be going on on the inside of a person that wouldn't do that. If you hated me, hated me, despised me, and you were a Christian, the least you could do is make sure that I'm not going to hell. The least. I don't believe that we have that church. I know a ton of you personally, and there are probably there's probably more than two percent of this church that's physically represented here, and this is only like a third of us. <clears throat> but there's only everybody got scared of the weather, I guess. It's beautiful out. Um, there there is more than two percent in the building sit it here today that I know have led people to Jesus this week. So we're not that church. Okay, but where do you sit in that? Just because we're not that church doesn't mean that you don't have a part to play. If God's called you here, which I hope that's why you're here, if you're just looking for a random thing to do on a Sunday morning, you have Missed the mark. <laughs> if God's called you here, then he has called you to, to connect with and to be on board with the vision and to be part of the body. If you're a hand and you're not doing what the rest of the body is doing, you, you know that's like the Adams Family. Anybody old enough to remember the Adams Family black and white TV show where there was a hand in a box? And he just did whatever he wanted to do anytime he can crawl across the table. During, it, that is not the body of Christ. The body of Christ is not a monster. It doesn't have 14 heads and people telling everybody what to do all the time. There's, there's no police member of the body, you know, running around judging people, telling everybody what they're doing wrong. They're, the body functions together. <clears throat> if you're not functioning with the body, then you are disjointed. And then the body has to walk around with a limp or a gimp or we can't function the way that we call it. So if you're, if you're here, I, I would like for you to, to be engaged, to be involved. 
because I believe that the Lord's connected your heart here. Otherwise, um, you probably wouldn't want to come to the crazy weirdo church in Lena on a really cold Sunday morning and, uh, and listen to me. <clears throat> Communication 2020. Since God in his wisdom saw to it that the world would never know, <laughs> the world would never know him through human wisdom. I could preach on that for a decade. Since God knew that, he has used our foolish preaching to save those that believe. There's one thing I need to highlight in this verse that I want to get for context today. God chose, God, the great chooser of all things, the smartest, wisest, just whatever word you can talk about that would, that, would, that would blow your mind as it relates to intelligence, God is that times a billion. It, he figured out gravity in the whole universe. We don't have a clue. We don't even know how to get to the speed of light. He started at the speed of light. Let there be light. We ain't even got there yet. He started that way. He chose. God chose that the way he's going to bring salvation is through preaching. And I, need, I, I really need you to get this. We are a spirit-filled church. We believe in the gifts of the spirit. We believe in healing. We believe in raising the dead. We've seen all those things take place. But God chose that salvation works through preaching. If you are healing the sick and not giving them the gospel, you, you know that you just made a mess in someone's life. You don't have to stand there and give them a 45-minute sermon and do an altar call and have them bow and, you know, profess over them, but give them the gospel. Like, hey, the reason you're healed is because Jesus loves you. And Jesus, not only did he heal you in his love, but he died on a cross for your sins and, and your failures so that you could have eternal life through him. Wow, okay, thanks. I mean, it's not hard to preach the gospel, y'all. But the point of this verse is, is that those who believe, <laughs> hopefully you're catching up with me. You know, we see these great evangelists, you know, like Reinhard Bonnke and, 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 and Billy Graham, and, we, and they're out there preaching and they're winning the lost to Jesus through their great, amazing preaching. And, and God bless them. Way to go. But this verse says that the preaching is for those that believe. Is anybody's gears going on this? You know, we think that this, we tend to look at verses like this and say, oh, this is evangelistic. You know, we're going to go out and win the loss with preaching. No, this is specifically saying that God has chosen this format a preacher and a preachy. God chose this format to bring salvation into your life. When I, when, I, when I say you should be in church, it's not because I get... Listen, God's not giving me some gold badge because we hit a magic number at Beloved Church. Is everybody... Like, I don't have like a... This isn't like my Twitter feed. And, and I have this many Twitter followers and this many beloved followers. I don't want butts in the chair just so that we can have some numbers that mean nothing. I want your butt in this chair every Sunday because I know that Jesus has given someone an hour's worth of information that is going to radically change your life and manifest his goodness in your life. You miss it, you miss it. You can miss it, beloved. You can be in the wrong place doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. It is not, that's not ungodly. That's not anti-Christ to say that. You can miss it. Now, can God redeem the time? Yes. But do you want to live your life always expecting God to redeem the time because you made the wrong choice in the, in the, first, in the foreground? Don't live your life 
always making choices that are going to make you depend upon the mercy of God. The mercy of God should kick in when you are running full speed and you trip over something you didn't see. God's mercy. Don't just say, well, man, God's mercy is awesome, so I'm going to do all the terrible things I can possibly do and just see how awesome God's mercy is. You are a fool. So again, I don't want you here because we need some numbers. I want you here because I know that the Holy Spirit, listen, I've looked at your faces for months in preparing for this. Months. I've seen your faces I look at you, I pray over you. I've seen, there's faces that I've seen that aren't here. And I'm, I am quite certain that God knew what temperature was going to be this morning. <laughs> and if the thermostat tells, or the thermometer tells you when you do or don't go to church, then please don't say Jesus is Lord. If how you feel, if you have some symptom, and if how a symptom makes you feel and you do or do not go to church, then don't say Jesus is Lord. Say your feelings are Lord. Is that, no, that didn't. We'll just go ahead and move on. So God chose, now, you know he he really, really, really thought about me. Because he used foolish in this verse. He was saying, there's going to be a bunch of suckers in 2020 that are going to listen to my son, Steve, who is a part-time court gesture in the throne room of grace. Which is why he says foolishness. That's one of the reasons. The other reason is because to the world or to your brain, there's a bunch of things that are totally normal in God's kingdom that are absolutely tilt to your brain. For example, if you do not have enough money, God's system is give. The world system is part-time job and overtime. And it'll destroy you. I cannot tell you how many people I know that hit retirement age or early retirement age and their bodies fell apart, their lives fell apart, everything fell apart, and within a few years they're dead because they burnt themselves out thinking that the way that they're going to get ahead in life is by working really, 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 really hard. It doesn't work that way. So I want to show you something, a revelation that I had not that long ago. This is, this is uh, something that's, that really affected me, and I had to do a, a ton of repentant, and we'll get to that. But I want you to get your Bibles out or your Bible app or your electronic device. If you need a Bible, we have Bibles. We would love to give you a Bible. So if you don't have a Bible, you are not going to be able to look at the screen, so you're not going to be able to read this unless you have a Bible or a Bible app. Who would like a Bible or a Bible? Uh, Well, I can't give you an app. I probably could. But uh, Kurt Knapp's here from the Gideons. They've got Bible apps. And so anyway, there's there's a ton of free ones. So anybody need a paper Bible that you can look at, you will not be able to look at the screen and read these verses. All right. Miss Dixie needs one. And you can keep this Bible. If for some reason you don't have a Bible, we would love to give you a Bible or two or however many you need in order to get in the Word. Didn't Dennis just, just exhort everyone in the room to be in the Word? Okay, it's hard to do if you don't have one. So in Exodus chapter 31, this is God in the process of building the temple. Now the, the parallel here, the... Uh, The type and shadow here is that you are now the temple of God. So God was was building the temple, the tabernacle, in in the book of Exodus for the first church. Just so you know, you are the first church. You are the tabernacle, the temple of God. So the parallels here, here are literally just, they're beautiful. This is amazing. And so God says in Exodus chapter 31, verse 1, The Lord says to Moses, see, I have called, uh, I'm using the ESV, see, I have called the, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uriah, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship, to devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver, 
and bronze, in cutting stones for settings, and in carving wood to work every craft. There are two people in the entire Old Testament, two, that were filled with the Spirit. There's a bunch of people that the Spirit came on them. And we had, uh, uh, my, my dad asked a question last week at Q&A Sunday about John the Baptist being filled with the Spirit. It was a, it was a come on, never go off. There's only two people, John the Baptist and Bezalel. And here's the thing, you've probably never heard a sermon on this fella. And he's one of only two people in the entire Old Testament that was filled with the Spirit. If you look this up in the Hebrew, it is literally being filled with Elohim, the Spirit of God, the Ruach, the specific Spirit of God himself. Now, there's a bunch of other places that said that people were filled with the spirit of wisdom, filled with the spirit of knowledge. Um, the spirit of strength came on Samson. There was, there was a lot of different people that were filled with aspects of the spirit, but this one specifically says, in a generic way, filled with the spirit. Only he and John the Baptist fit this category. I double dog dare you to search the scriptures and email me later if you find something contrary. I can tell you I searched them in all the ways you can search them, and I'm telling you the truth. There's two people, and this was the first. There's something about the about first mention in the scriptures. The first person filled with the Spirit was given. And I really, I can't, I could preach a whole sermon on this, so I'm going to synopsize this. He was filled with the Spirit for the purpose of artistically and beautifully building the tabernacle. He was in charge of building the tabernacle. And it was one of the most beautiful structures to date that had ever been built expensive when they went and rebuilt the temple and then the second temple. The second temple is said to be still to this day the most expensive building ever built in human history. It was, it was, it was, up, it was close to a trillion dollars of what it cost to build the second temple. A trillion. God doesn't do... <laughs> Listen, when he built you, he took the best stuff. Those four amens just ain't warming my heart. I'm telling you. God didn't put junk in you. He didn't take all the leftovers in the cosmos and decide to put, patch you together like some ragdoll. He took the best and built your temple. This is one of the reasons that it really irks me when people complain about the things that they are, aspects of their life or aspects of it, because God gave you that. When people complain about their spouses, or God gave you that. Well, I don't like my nose. God gave you that. Why don't you like it? I'm not saying there's things on me that are perfect, that they're perfect to me. I stand in front of the mirror naked and unashamed. Just me and God. Amen. And if Kay comes in the room, we shut the door. <laughs> and I should be naked and unashamed in front of her. But it, like, it's okay. You, you got quirks. You got stuff going on. That doesn't mean that you're broken. doesn't mean that something's wrong. There means that there's probably a purpose that you don't understand. Only two people in the entire Old Testament were filled with the Spirit of God. This fella and John the Baptist. And I'll tell you this, they both had the same purpose. To artfully, beautifully prepare a people for the presence of God. So let me say this. In 4,000 years of human history, the only reason God ever filled the first two people with the Spirit was for the purpose of communication. 
And now we are the spirit-filled people after the day of Pentecost, and we don't use the Holy Spirit to give us good communication. Only two people had the honor in the Old Testament of having what you have on a regular basis. And the specific function for the Holy Spirit in their lives was to make them beautiful communicators, artful, artistic communicators. John the Baptist led the greatest revival that, Juda that Judaism and Judea and Jerusalem had ever seen. In six months, John the Baptist affected about seven million people. Six months. Now, I'm a good preacher. Uh, it's all right. Jesus affirms me. I'm a good preacher. But if I went from zero to six, seven million people in six months, I'll guarantee you that CNN and Fox News, everybody in the world would be standing outside Beloved Church and say, what in the world? John the Baptist and Bezalel, they were artistic. They were perfect. They were pristine. Now, what's really cool is that one was in the beauty, the physical beauty. John the Baptist specifically wasn't in the physical beauty. He wore, he wore camel skin and ate locusts and probably had bug's legs hanging out of his beard, and he lived in the Jordan River, so he had wrinkled toes probably every day, and it wasn't the physical beauty of what he was, it was the beauty of what he was accomplishing through his words. So here's what I have to say about this. When I got this revelation, I realized that I was not doing this well, and I'm sorry. I, I've always eschewed the artistic thing because I stink at it. I can't make stick figures look like stick figures. And so I've just always like, okay, fine. Someone else is in charge of art, and I'll do all the, you know, I'll do the mechanic stuff. Like, I'll break stuff. And if you need someone to tear a room apart, call this guy. I'll, I can tear them apart with the best of them. You need someone to decorate your room. You, make sure I'm on the other side of the world traveling, doing missionary work when you're doing that. Because if I'm even in the same town, it could jack it up. And so I've always eschewed this whole artistic thing, and I came to realize that on, uh, on accident, I was eschewing a nature of God that he had given me in order for me to accomplish the destiny that he had given me, because he needs me to be beautiful and artful in communication. I have got to put gold where gold goes, and silver where silver goes, and bronze where bronze goes. In case you don't know, those are three different... They have three different applications. Gold is talking about the purity. Silver is talking about um, the preciousness. And bronze talks about judgment. And there's times for all of that. There's times for correction. There's times for exhortation. There's times for teaching. There's time, all these things. And, and because I've eschewed one of, the, one of the important aspects of what the Spirit of God lives in me to do, I've missed it. And so I'm repentant, and you guys get to see me change. So congratulations on so we have naked Steve. Man, I thought for sure it was going to be like, it's going to be like people throwing stuff at me or, or jumping up and giving me a standing ovation. Yeah, get naked, Pastor. So this is, this is my naked Steve. You see, this is a big polar bear because I'm like a big bear. And he's ashamed because he's hiding his face, right? He's, oh, he's naked and ashamed. So let me, let me, uh, let me, this, I, this is really fun to see you guys squirm talking about naked Steve. But we'll go, uh, we'll go ahead and move on to the second point. Dennis and, and Bob, they are not going to get naked. I'm the one that's getting naked. What happened that kind of led into some of the things that, that we're going to talk about this morning is, if you, some of you may remember six or, I don't know, a few uh, while ago, a few while ago, um, Bob had a word for Dennis and Madi, and Bob came up, and Dennis and Madi came up, and Bob gave Dennis a word, and Dennis received it, so much so that he flew way over there. And I didn't see or hear anything. I was in the yellow room with Cinderella, and we were uh, hanging out with Daniel. I heard the thump, clunk, 
bang, chicky, chicky, and peeked my head out just to make sure I didn't have to use my pistol. But other than that, I didn't have a clue. But I know how the kingdom operates to the degree that, <laughs> that I know that there are sometimes some really, really pronounced manifestations of how the Spirit of God interacts with people. There's a bunch of times that the Spirit of God is going to interact with you that your body can't take it. Uh, for those of you that um, remember your BC days and you used to get high on drugs, what drugs do is they over-affect your body and produce manifestations of things that go beyond what you think your physical capabilities are. This is what happens in medicine when they give you like a painkiller. It literally goes to your brain, it shuts things down, it turns other things on, it manipulates you and gives you a manifestation. When the Spirit of God comes on you, he's so holy, he's so righteous, he's so good, that there's a bunch of times that your body just doesn't know what to do with all that. He's the most high. It's better than ever being high. Dennis is a person who is really, um, and I, I, I'm in awe of this, and I honor this. Dennis is a person who is very, very receptive to the Spirit of God. Very receptive. He is probably, uh, of all the people that are really close in my life, that are, that are dear to my heart, Dennis is one of the, one of the people that I, I confide in and I can trust that he hears from God. If there's something that I'm praying about that's really, really important, I will ask him to pray with me and hear, if he hears something, I want to know about it. Dennis is very, very receptive to the Holy Spirit. So what happened up here was Bob started to speak a word to Dennis, and the word itself physically overwhelmed Dennis. Power of God. So what I did was I knew that something happened, and so my intentions were to stand up here and explain to the church this. And I failed. I thought I did an awesome job. And then I did, which is something that everybody in this room needs to embrace, which is called feedback. Feedback. You married couples. Don't assume that because you said something that it's going to be heard. You better get feedback. Parents are good at this. Uh, Gunner, go mow the lawn. It, and then I say that, and I turn over here, and I'm in my office, and I'm studying, and, and 20 minutes later, I get up to refill my coffee, coffee, and Gunner's laying on the couch playing Candy Crush. Gunner, did you hear me? Why did I say, did you hear me? Because in, we know this in a human way, but it was actually originated by God. Hearing and doing are the same. That's why James talks about this. How do you say you're in faith and you're not doing it? It's, you're lying. Hearing and doing are the same thing. In fact, um, there's a Jewish prayer called the Shema. The, in the Shema prayer, it, you probably know this, Jesus quoted it. He says, hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one God. Hear, O Israel, what? It's not hear like you can't hear, you're deaf and you can't hear. It's hear as in the way that you should hear and do. Hear and obey. In fact, in the Hebrew, you, if you want someone to obey you, you say hear, hear. You repeat hear. When I stood up to... to explain, I actually made a mess. And I was humbled by the fact that there were multiple people like, hey, what was the stuff and the thing and, the, and what were you trying to do? And so I reached out to a bunch of other people and I said, hey, listen to this, tell me what you thought. And all of the feedback that I got was congruent, which said I failed at communicating properly that scenario. And so I had to apologize. I had a meeting with Dennis and Marty, and I apologized to, 
to them, and I'm like, man, I'm sorry. I was trying to explain that this was a good thing. And they're saying, well, it didn't really happen because the people were kind of confused after you said what you said. And I'm like, well, what's wrong with the people? The second thing that I need to be naked about was, a, this is also a little while back, was that I'm, I'm always, I don't want to say it. In the past, my mortal enemy has been that clock. Because I so love being here with you. And I've had a conversation with the Lord. I'm like, why do you tell me 15 hours worth of stuff and then you give me 50 minutes? I haven't got an answer yet. <laughs> He'll probably give me one at some point. I, I would assume that 14 hours and 10 minutes of it was for me. Or he's going to want me to do a 15-part miniseries. Either way, I, I'm okay with that. But I, all the, when I go home, and every once in a while, we don't do this very often, but um, I'll say, hey, Kay, how do you, how did you think that went? And she's like, you could have went longer. Because she also knows that when I get right up to the end and I know that the clock is fighting against me and, and I'm at the end and I'm trying to, it's like I'm, this is some of the important, because like I built the whole thing and, and here's, the, here's the climactic moment, but then I got to go really fast through it because the time, and she's like, yeah, you could have done better with that. Which means, really, honestly, what it means is, is that some of those things that I might have got bogged down with earlier, not bogged down, um, so the, the rabbit trails or the little side stuff that I was saying before, probably some of that stuff probably didn't need to be there and then make the climactic moment more climactic. I don't know. Here's what I'm saying. I'm not a perfect communicator yet. If you are, please raise your hands so you can lay hands on me after the service so I can be perfect. Okay. Um, I'm going that way. I will be. Not yet. One of the things that I did imperfectly was that I turned, um, I, said, uh, I said a terrible thing about Ed being um, like against, I don't remember exactly what my terminology was, but I, anyway, I implicated Ed like he was the one that the reason was that I was fighting with the clock. I turned Ed into my scapegoat. And I don't know how many of you paid attention, maybe you just ignore me at the end of the service anyway, but um, I, I said something about Ed and I implicated him and, I, and it was a bad thing and I had to apologize to him and apologize to the board and I need to apologize to all of you because some of you were in the room. And it was not right. And I'm not going I'm, to, I'm, I thrive on the fact that I believe that the Holy Spirit is going to um, lead me and I'm going to respond appropriately so that things like that will never happen again. Now, if it does, you have the right to come to me. You don't have the right to go to 14 other people and start sidebar conversations and whisper and backbite. I'm not saying that that took place, but normally in our society, that's what happens. Something happens between two people, and instead of them going and working it out, they start this whole subculture. And they get Facebook involved in. I mean, have anybody ever seen the post? Well, you know, there's a person out there that's a terrible, horrible individual, and someone needs to run them over with a car. I'm not really going to say who. And then the thread is like, oh, we all know who you're talking about. Why didn't you just go to them and work out your problem instead of defecating all over social media? Because we don't, that's not the kind of society we are. We do not have a society that Jesus told us to have, especially even in the church. We do not have a Matthew 18 society, which is where if you have a problem with your brother, you go to your brother. It, it seems like the simplest thing ever. And almost nobody does it. Well, I can't go talk to them about what they said. So you're going to talk to everybody else about what they said? Because they know? You know how many problems would be solved if you just went, hey, well, Craig, what did you mean when you said such and such and so and so? Oh, well, I meant that, you know, that I like blue skies. Well, I had no idea that that's what you meant. 
Well, thanks for asking. Well, that clears everything up. Ha 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 ha. Isn't this magical? You know, Jesus knew about this. And he said that this is the only way he's supposed to go to church. I just talked to someone yesterday who's suing. <laughs> I, you can't make this up. Bob says that all the time. You, there's a person in a church who goes to the church with his father who is suing his father. I don't know how to unravel how bad that is. Not only do you have a problem with your, your natural father, so much so that you can't work it out, but you also go to the same church. What in the world? And you go to the carnal courts that basically worship Satan to go work the problem out? That's like, a, that's like three strikes you're out. That's terrible. But people do this all the time. People trust the judgment of a court more than they would, they would trust the judgment of the elders at the church. You know that, right? Christians, not just people, Christians, people that call upon the name of the Lord, who the Lord told them how to work a problem out, they will trust a court. They'll trust Judge Judy before they'll trust Judy Love. And I can tell you, Judge Judy, probably not filled with the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of insight, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of truth. And they will trust her more than they will trust a woman of God. That is horrible that we have degraded in our society to that point. But it happens. If I do something like this, with making a mess out of something I was trying to explain, like I did with Dennis and Bob. If I say some dumb thing, trying to be funny or trying to work against the crock, and I hurt someone like Ed, first off, not my intention. Now, the, the interesting thing is when I went and got feedback, people that really, 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 really super duper loved me, and people that did it just based upon the innocuous thing that I asked them to do, had nothing to do with me. The people that super duper duper crazy awesome loved me, they were like, oh, everything was great. You said everything perfect, and I got a bunch of stuff out of it. And the people that just did exactly what I told them to do, just give me just raw feedback. The people that did that said, ah, you kind of made it confusing. So even in feedback, it filters through how opinions work. It, here's, here's what's interesting. I asked people to give me feedback about something that was recorded. It's not like, hey, do you remember what I said six months ago on that one service that one day, right about 20 minutes in? Uh, yeah, sure, preacher. No, like, listen to the recording, tell me what I said. And two of the folks that I got feedback from said, I don't know what you're trying to say. I'm like, man, I stink. At least I stunk at that. So I'm going to get better. So that's me being naked. Thank you for, for all of your grace. This is something that, that we need to understand, and this is why I'm standing up here being naked and repenting and, and apologizing in front of everybody Truth and transparency will cost you something. Right now, it's costing me pride, which, praise God, I could kill my pride all day long, and it'd be getting me better and better and better. Truth and transparency is going to cost you something. This is why people don't do it. People will not be honest, and they will not be transparent, because it will cost you something. The problem is, lying and obscurity cost you everything. And you think that you're protecting your future by lying. And all you did was you moved the problem into the future with interest. I was just talking to um, someone that I love the other day. And, and there's a terrible thing going on in their family. And they're working through some stuff. And there's a, uh, a young child in their family 
and they, have, they chose, as a family, they chose to, t to lie to this child to protect them from all the stuff that's going on in the family. And my counsel to them was, tell the truth. And they said, but it'll, it'll hurt her. It'll hurt her. It'll destroy her. It'll, it'll whatever. I'm like, it, it would be better for her to be hurt by the truth than to be murdered by a lie later on. How would you feel when she came back to you at 20 and she said, I can't trust you because 12 years ago you lied to me about one of the biggest things that ever happened in our family. You lied to me and you kept me in a lie for eight years. Now I'm 20 years old and you want me to trust you? Truth and transparency will cost you something. And depending on who you are, it might cost you a lot. Because some of us are really good at not being transparent and not being truthful. But no matter what it costs you to be honest and transparent, it is always going to be less than lying and obscurity will cost you because it will cost you everything. If you're honest and transparent, you get Jesus to help you through it. He gets to pay the bill for what it costs you. But if you lie and you go into obscurity, you've just signed a contract with Satan. You should hate lying and obscurity, darkness, you should hate it more than you hate child rape. Because it's actually worse. He is the father of lies. Everything that comes from darkness comes from lying. And we have to hate it and eschew it. <clears throat> now, if you remember, if you're, this is communication 2020. This is communication 33. So it just went back in time 2,000 years to kind of prove the point. So this is Jesus with Nicodemus in John chapter 3. There was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. Real quick, that means he was the smartest of the smart of all the spiritual people in the land. He'd be like me. After <laughs> Thanks, Cindy. After, after dark one evening... <laughs> He was so bold that he went to Jesus after dark in an alley, and he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. He was totally convinced that Jesus was the man. And spiritually, too, miraculous signs, God. He's talking like from a spiritual point of view. He is in the groove. He is spiritualizing. He's, he's on the team. And then Jesus replies to him, I tell you the truth, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom. So they're, they're grooving together. Jesus is teaching, Nicodemus is asking, and, and so Jesus is telling him what's going on. Hey, the reason you're seeing these miraculous signs, the reason you're seeing God do some stuff through me, is because when you're born again, when you're born of the Spirit, like, some awesome stuff can take place in your life. And so the amazing, awesome, spiritualized Nicodemus says, what do you mean? How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Can, can I say that Jesus didn't say anything about going back into your mother's womb? Can, can I say like to jump from this super spiritual stuff that they were just grooving with together to go, uh, are you saying I need to go call my old elderly mother and see if I can, come on now. Do you know this happens all the time? And then Jesus answered him and said, I assure you, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard anybody say to me in any meeting ever. He probably wanted to say that. He didn't. If he would have been Pastor Steve, he probably would have said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that was ignorant. <laughs> but how many times do we hear something, but we don't hear something? Right? Didn't Jesus say, he that has ears to hear? <clears throat> Perspective. So the little cartoon there is two guys looking at the same thing from two different perspectives. And both of them are seeing something different, and both of them are right. Now think about that. 
They're both seeing the same thing. And they're both right. But they are in complete division with each other. Hello, married couples. You know how important perspective is? Perspective can be the difference between heaven and hell. Perspective can be the difference between poverty and wealth. Perspective can be the difference between healing and sick. Perspective. If I say, by the stripes of Jesus Christ, you were healed 2,000 years ago, and you join me in my perspective, you'll be healed. But if you say, well, that verse means that you're just going to get some spiritual healing, and a fairy's going to come sprinkle pixie dust on you, and you're going to glow in the dark when you're 147. Well, then you, me and you have different perspective. We both read the same verse. We both had opportunity to the same truth. You seen a nine, I seen a six. I walk in divine health. I'm not saying I'm right, even though I am. The definition of perspective is a particular way of viewing things that depends on one's experience and personality. You filter what you see, what you hear, through your personality and through your past experiences. One of the clearest examples I had of this is one I was preaching at a, a marriage retreat, and I had, uh, it was awesome, I had all the gals, and God bless them, they gave me the opportunity to minister to a room full of gals, and my job, my job was to minister on the finished work of the cross, and how it related to them as gals, and I was super crazy passionate. I mean, it was awesome. And I got done, and we went out, and we had lunch, and I'm sitting with Kay, and we're eating lunch, and, and one of the gals that was in the room came and sat down next to me at the lunch. And she said, I need to apologize to you. And I said, what for? She goes, she goes, you were about 10 or 15 minutes into your message, and you were so passionate, and your voice, you have a huge booming voice. Did you know that? And I said, I've heard that. And, he's, and, it, and, and you just were so passionate and so engaged. And so I was actually scared. You reminded me of my ex-husband who used to abuse me. And I didn't listen to what you were saying. And about 15 minutes before you got done, I checked back in and I heard some of the most important and life-changing things I've ever heard in my entire life. And she goes, I need to apologize that I missed all that. Will I, can I please have your notes? Can I please have? And I said, sis, I'll call you up and re-preach it. She missed nearly everything I said because of a past experience that she had with an abusive man. And here's a man in the room in an authoritative position that immediately set her back 10, 15, 20 years, and it blocked everything that the Spirit of God wanted to do in her perspective. A good perspective means the ability to consider things in relation to one another accurately and correctly. So for our two little dudes here, you know, if, if homeboy came on this side and this fellow went on this side, you know, they would actually come into agreement about what's actually on the ground. Good perspective means that you can do that. Let me explain something here. I can understand and not have to agree. This is another great one for you married couples. You can understand, but not necessarily agree. But as a married couple, you will have to get into agreement. If you are making decisions, and you are not in unity, you have invited the devil into your decisions. If you are making decisions, and you're in unity, you've invited the spirit of unity, the Holy Spirit, into your decisions. I can tell you this, even if you make a wrong decision or a bad decision, and you do it in unity, and you do it in transparency, and you do it in genuineness, you give God a ton of stuff to work with. But if you make a good decision in disunity, there is nothing good that can come out of it until you get into unity and God works all things together for good. That's really important, and I, can't, I don't have enough time to go there. 
The way you see things is a result of who you are and your filter. That word filter could be viewpoint, could be standpoint, but everybody in this room, you have a filter. It's called your eyeballs. You see things with your eyeballs, you hear things with your ears in a way that only you hear and see them. Scientifically, we can prove this. If I got an eye transplant and I got somebody else's eyes, I would have to relearn how to see. The way I see colors, the way you see colors. Dennis was colorblind for a long time. And the Spirit of God made him see. <laughs> Praise God. And when he started seeing colors, it was, it was hilarious. <laughs> That's not, not, that sounded bad. He knows what I mean. It was, it was fun. It was fun going through the process with him when he went from colorblind to seeing colors because he's like, well, that's what purple is? So you're saying that's been green this whole time? And I'm like, dude. <laughs> because when you're colorblind, it's just different shades of gray. And you pick up on textures and patterns and stuff like that. I don't exactly know. He could probably tell better. But he, when he's seeing color for the first time, you realize that every, all the perspective for color changed. So that's what green is, that's what blue is, that's what, this, this is, this is you. If you grew up and in your village and you never left your village, if they told you that this podium was white and then you miraculously disappeared from your village and sat on the front row at Beloved Church and I came and said, you know, this black podium, you'd be like, no, pastor. That podium's white. Uh, no, weird visitor. This is black. No, that's white. You know, if the world has told you all your life a certain thing, and then I stand here, or Dennis stands here, or anybody stands here, Ryan sings that, and it's something that's contrary to what you believe, you have to make a decision. Do I believe what I've learned, or do I believe what's being said now? And, I, and sad to say, most people in the church just say, well, that was a fun song. Anyway, any hooser, let's just get back to the reality. Yeah, that was, a really good, that was a really good message, preacher. Really inspired me. That was really awesome. So anyway, what time the bears come on? The way you see things is a result of who you are and your filter. A filter is a porous article of mass as of paper, sand, or glass through which a gas or a liquid is passed to separate out matter. You do this all the time. You hear something that someone says and you separate out the parts that you like or you don't like. Okay, if you don't believe me. What spectrum are you on the political scale? If you hate Donald Trump, he could say, uh, I, God bless America. If you hate Donald Trump, you say, you hypocrite, or what God are you talking to? Are you talking to Satan? If you love Donald Trump, you'd be like, that's right, Trump, get God in your sentence. Same sentence, two different filters. I have a, my ex-boss in, in, in Dallas, Fort Worth, is on the entire other end of the spectrum politically than I am. And he loves being there. God bless him. <laughs> Poor fella. And, uh, and he texts me all the time. And he'll, they will take the exact same story. And there is a left version and there is a right version. There, no longer in the world today is there just news where you just get information and you decide what to think. Now you get information and then you get with it the rhetoric to tell you how to think about it. And it's both sides. It's left and right. And this, I don't think we realize how much this has influenced this. The pulpit. Because you get to decide whether what I'm saying is right or wrong. How does that influence your marriage? Well, I know she said that, but that's not what she meant. I'll tell you what she really meant. Maybe she really meant what she meant, cowboy. <clears throat> A filter on purpose is supposed to take things out. Don't do that. 
Don't take things out. Don't filter the things that God has for you. A right perspective makes anything possible. If you read the Bible and your perspective is this is true and this is more true than what I experienced, you can have anything that you desire. Let me tell you about me. I'm a pastor. I'm a leader. I'm a mechanic. If you add all that together, what that means is I fix things. And sometimes you're the thing. (laughs) And that's not okay for me to look at everything as pastor, leader, or mechanic. Maybe you're not a broken brake job. Okay, let me, let me go one. I have three brothers. You know what that means? Sometimes love is a bloody nose. Okay, nobody else has any big brothers. Okay, sometimes love is a bloody nose. Okay, here, let me, let me help you. I had no sisters. And my mom, God bless her, was not engaged in me ever understanding the female psyche of any, in any way. The first real sister I ever had in my life was Stacy Castle. If it was not for Kay, my wife, who spent 25 years, and it nearly killed her on multiple occasions, trying to teach me how the woman's psyche works, how women think, The difference between, can I get a witness that I don't care what society says, there's a difference between men and women. Okay, praise God, I'm at the right church. If you're gender confused, (laughs) that is a terrible place to be. And you should not be gender confused. It's not that complicated. I'll read your birth certificate and tell you for you. I had three brothers. I had no sisters. You know, when I... When I first got married with Kay, you know, I I thought it was my job was to fix her. (laughs) Some of y'all are catching on. We had role reversal. Um, Here's another thing, too. When gals communicate, I'm waiting to hear the problems so I can give them the solution. All the gals in the room are shaking their head at me. You're an idiot. Okay, I didn't have sisters. Have we covered this? I didn't know that gals just like to talk. Just to tell you the story. Even in counseling sessions, gals will talk about stuff. And I'm like, can you please tell me the problem so I can get my wrenches out? And there, it's, there's no problem. They're just telling me stuff. It's taken me decades to figure this out. And I know you're thinking, I'm a complete idiot. But no, it's just because I was, it's my brothers. I'm going to blame it on my brothers. We didn't talk about how our day went. If you asked them how their day went, they usually showed you with a two by four across the back of the head. That's how my day went. Okay, now I won't ask. But Kay and I would, I I had to on purpose come home from work or from stuff, and Kay and I would talk about our days. And I wasn't allowed to fix stuff. I didn't know that this was normal. I thought it was just Kay. And then I got sisters. And I realized I was an idiot. So some of the problems of my communication is I didn't understand this. So all the gals in the room, I'm sorry, because I probably did it to you. I tried to fix a problem you didn't ask me to fix. Another thing is is that I've spent all my life in the Word of God. I was born again and spirit-filled when I was five years old, and we read the Bible. King James, all the time. The bad thing was is that we read it through a cult and through some some bad doctrine. The good thing was we were in the Word. So here's the thing. Now since all that stuff got redeemed, I know the Bible. I know the Bible really, really, really well. And sometimes actually, believe it or not, that's a hindrance in how I communicate. Because I'm assuming that people know what I know. Does anybody ever assume that other people know what you know? Okay. That's a problem. 
And if you make references to things that have an entire revelation associated to it and you think people get it, so then you go back into some kind of counseling session, why didn't you get this? And you're like, I don't even have a clue what you're talking about. Which means I was the problem. <clears throat> Another thing is, is that I am all about divine destiny and divine purpose. If I'm talking to you, probably somewhere in there, I'm filtering that kind of stuff. And what's your purpose? What's your destiny? What are, you, are you getting there? What are you doing today? What about your purpose? About your destiny? What are you, can I just watch a movie? No. Is it a movie about your destiny? <laughs> it, I, sometimes I, I think it, it wears on people, and so just give me some grace if that's you. If I'm trying to go there, just say, hey, pastor, right now, pretend I'm a girl, and we're just talking about our day. And I'll totally get it now, because I've grown up. <clears throat> Another thing is, is that it's not just about communicating, it's about listening. This is communication. Believe it or not, just stay with me. So my job is to seek the Spirit of God. As I seek the Spirit of God, as I pray, as I get in the Scriptures, what God is going to do is He's going to show me this side of the room and all the things that are going on here and, the, and what's happening with the people and what needs to happen, and He's going to reveal to me whatever needs to be revealed. And then this side of the room where all the girls sit, He's going to be really slow on showing me the other side of the room so that I can communicate. See, now I get all this worked out through prayer, through study, and so what I've done is I've done the best I can from my side of communication. But can I get a witness? Just because my side's okay doesn't mean that you are seeing what you need to see. And I could stand here and I could say, but I did a great job of studying, of getting it worked out and having good language, and, and I really thought I had it all figured out. Hey, Mitchell, can you please come up here because you're a great listener. Mitchell has a responsibility as a listener. Mitchell's on this side of the room. Mitchell needs to reveal me. So if you would please, reveal me. Now what Mitchell is doing is that he is removing some past experiences. He's removing whether it's important or unimportant or relative. He's removing any kind of sensitivity or offense that he might have in his heart or his mind towards me or towards the person ministering or towards his spouse or whatever's going on. He, he's got feelings and emotions that could be a blockade, but as he re lowers those things as a good listener, we get to see each other eye to eye, and we see each other the way that we should. If you're offended, you do know that if you're offended... This could not get thicker. And it doesn't matter who talks to you. You know, Jesus talked to people and told them the truth and gave them an opportunity to eternal life, and they crucified him. Thanks, bro. There's never been a better communicator than Jesus Christ. And they crucified him. Mary, will you come up? Mary's a good listener. I'm going to actually use Mary as an example. <laughs> She's shaking in her boots right now. Mary... Mary needs to be communicated to differently than Mitchell. Mary's on this side. And remember, I had to be really purposeful about making sure that I get all my stuff worked out. So now Mary needs to make sure that she opens up to the different ways that I communicate. Because they may be different than what she's accustomed to. And as she opens up to what I'm trying to communicate, she's going to hear me and see me the right way. So it's not just about me making sure communication is right. It's about making sure that Mary is a good listener. She doesn't have any fence or feelings or emotions that are going to stop it. Mary called me a couple weeks ago. Thanks, Mary. Mary called me a couple weeks ago, and she said, why did you say the thing that you said about the Holy Spirit? I said, I don't remember saying that. She said, well, you did. I said, well, why don't you listen to it again and tell me exactly where it was and what I said, and I'll fix it. 
I was ready to stand up here. I mean, I had this plan. I'm going to stand up here and get naked anyway. Might as well just make the list as long as possible. And she called me back. She said, oh, I misheard. What you really said was this, and what I thought you said was this. Hey, if you're not getting a copy, if you are not subscribed to our YouTube channel, if you are not getting our podcast, you are probably not hearing what God is trying to say on Sunday morning. Thank you for that one amen. It's not just about a good communicator, it's also about being a good listener. If you are not listening to the purposes and the intentions that your wife is trying to, then you're going to miss it. God knows this. Eight times Jesus said, if you have ears, you need to use them to hear. Eight times. The best communicator in the universe said that you need to listen. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, Titus chapter 3, verse 5, and Ephesians 4, 23, all say the same thing, that you need to renew your mind. What is renewing your mind? That means that you hear correctly. It means you understand the way God understands. Which also means that in a, in a current condition of what you are right now, your mind is not renewed. Maybe it's renewed better than mine. Maybe it's renewed better than it was last week. But it's still not renewed. There's a renewing that can take place today. There's a renewing that can take place tomorrow. If you are not purposefully being renewed, then you are going to be conformed to the world. As you renew your mind, it's amazing. Has anybody ever at 18 thought they knew everything? And then when you got to 38, you realized how incredibly wise your parents were and how stupid you were. Anybody else? What happened? Your mind got renewed in a natural way, but this is a spiritual truth too, that you can renew your mind. And some of the dumb things you used to believe in church, you came to beloved church and got fixed. So here's two, uh, here's two, here's three important things about communication. You need to understand what was said, what was meant, and what was heard. Don't you dare say that you heard something from someone if you know on purpose that it's contrary to their heart, to their character, to their nature. Well, I can't believe Pastor Steve would talk to me that way. Maybe I didn't. I can't believe my wife would say that to me. Maybe she didn't. Maybe you misheard because these three things have to be in healthy communication. You have got to hear what was meant to be heard. What was said, what was meant, what was heard. This is a great example. So this is a couple of text messages. This is from Dad. He says, hello, daughter. She says, hi, Dad. It's 2 a.m. Why in the world are you still up? He says, your mom and I decided to separate. And she said, what? Why? I don't understand. And he said, stay up late, not separate. iPhone. Dad, oh my goodness, not funny. Mom is laughing. Does anybody know what that is? Autocorrect. In case of emergency, this is Mama, the wife, says, hey, honey, I love you. And then he responds, well, how's the morning sickness? She said, well, it's not too bad today. I can't believe we're having another baby. Women are just communicating. Nothing to fix there, right? I can't believe we're having another baby. And he says, I'm leaving you. And she says, what? He says, now, period. I'm leaving work now. I am not leaving you. She said, now I'm really going to throw up. (laughs) What happened? Autocorrect. You know, your phone does what your head does. Well, I heard you say. Smartphone keyboards are tiny and close together. Autocorrect suggests alternative words. You know that your brain is always suggesting alternative things that are contrary to the truth? All day long. Are you sure you're really healed? Because your body doesn't feel healed. Are you sure you're really prosperous? Because your bank account doesn't say that. Are you sure that that pastor loves you because he said terrible things about you? Are you sure your wife loves you because she's always trying to make you eat vegetables? Autocorrect, 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 autocorrect. Anybody ever like the autocorrect? You almost had to like literally shut it off in order to send what you're trying to say. You know, there's times that you literally have to shut off 
shut off the things of this world to truly get what God's got to say. If you're in the scriptures and the enemy doesn't come to distract you with some dumb thought or some dumb rabbit trail, you are probably not reading the Bible. So there's an invitation. You have a royal invitation. There's, there's difference in invitations. There's a pulpit invitation, and there's a pul- personal invitation. Let me say this. When I stand here, I believe that everybody that has chosen to put their beautiful little rumps in those purple chairs, I believe that you have given me an invitation to minister what the Lord has said. Okay. But for, for the half of you that responded to that, great! I'm going to do that. If you show up here, your showing up is an act of faith that says that you are going to receive what this pulpit has to offer from me, from Dennis, from guest ministers, from Ryan, from the worship team. You showing up is an act of faith that says my heart is ready to receive what you have for me. I actually spent gas to get here to do that. I'm ready to receive And so I am going to stand up here and I am going to be very bold about releasing to you what I believe that the Lord is saying. But here's the thing. That does not happen if you and I are having a personal conversation. There are people in this room that I have hurt you because I went somewhere that I wasn't invited. And I'm sorry. Here's the other thing, too. Just because you, inv- you were invited one time doesn't mean you stay invited. Married couples, super important. Just, cause some, just because your spouse lets you in some place in your heart at 2.30 a.m. because you guys are in deep doesn't mean that you just get to jump right back into that noon the next day. There are some places that are private and that are personal And people only let other people into those places very, very selectively. This is something I'm going to get better at. If you want me into a place of your life, you have got to invite me. And I've got to know that I can go there. I'm not just going to insert myself in any situation in your life. I will stand back and watch you destroy your life but do whatever I can to protect the relationship. Because I believe at some point the destruction will overwhelm you, and I want to be standing there when you're overwhelmed with a solution. But I need an invitation. Permission. And in case you didn't understand this, this is exactly what Jesus says to you. Don't assume that just because you're filled with Jesus, that Jesus has permission to go everywhere in your life that he wants to. It's the worst thing you could ever assume. Well, I'm born again. God can do whatever he wants to do. That's That's the most terrible revelation you think that you've ever had. Jesus stands and knocks. This verse that we use, again, as an evangelical verse, trying to win people to Jesus with this verse, was a verse from Jesus' lips to the church. To the church. He was telling the church, I am knocking on the door. You have got to let me in. He was telling the church, not the lost, not the sinner. He was telling the church, which means you, beloved. Jesus Christ knocks on your heart. Whatever doors you open to him, he has permission and invitation to get into. Whatever doors you keep shut, he'll knock. And I've decided to be more like Jesus in this area and in my place of leadership. I'm going to knock. I might ask for permission. Hey, can I talk to you about that? But if you say no, I'm not going to open mouth, insert foot. Give Jesus permission to come into places that he wasn't before. So if I have uh, all the ushers, please, we're going to hand out. We are asking, as part of our family meeting, we're going to ask for help. There are places, there are functions in the church that don't have enough people participating with them. And so we need help. Volunteers. 
volunteers that are going to be genuine and faithful. Okay, by faithful, what I mean is be more faithful to your church than you are to your job. It's amazing to me sometimes how people will go to a place they don't want to go to and do things they don't want to do for money that they say they don't like. But then when they're asked to do something at church, they're late or they don't do it or they don't feel like it. So you'll do it for money, but you won't do it for Jesus. So um, go ahead and hand out to everybody. You don't have to volunteer, but there's an invitation for you to see how I rolled that in with the invitation thing. This is an invitation for you to volunteer. You're, you're welcome to volunteer. Maybe, maybe, maybe you'll be qualified, maybe you won't. If you want to volunteer and, and be a part of the kids' church, we're going to do a background check. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. For all the people in the room that have kids, we want us to do background checks. The only person that wouldn't want us to do a background check is somebody who's got a bad background. We're still going to check. The reason that we need to have genuine is because right here in Acts 16, 15, it says that when she was baptized, her and her whole household, she besought us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. She was so happy to be a part of the house of God that she used that change in her life to invite people into her home and be hospitable. You know, it's actually part of the gospel is for you to be hospitable, to invite people to your home, to invite people into your lives. For all of you that have a dirty house, clean it up. Sorry. <laughs> You're supposed to have people at your house. Moreover, it's required in a steward that a man be found faithful. The number one qualification for you to be effective in ministry, those of you in the room that want to do more for God, the number one, the starting, the foundation characteristic, faithful. If you want to know if you're faithful, come ask me. I'll tell you. It might cost me to give you the truth and be transparent. <clears throat> Secondly, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but I got him out. And I'm going to leave him there for a while. We have grace groups. Dennis talked about it, so I'm not going to belabor the point. But if you are not in a grace group, you are missing one of the core values of what we are as beloved church. We are not here for a Sunday morning crowd to come and nod to God, as Dennis said. Um, we are here to make disciples. In fact, the only reason I started this church was because God told me to come to Illinois and make disciples. And I didn't know where to find disciples, and so I started a church, and I'm like, ha-ha, found the disciples. So if you're not being discipled, you're really actually kind of missing one of the core values of what we are as beloved. And here's the reason. What ha I need grace groups. Steve's got issues. I need a group of people that I can be honest with, that I can sit there, that can pray for me, that I can pray with, that, man, I need that. You can't do that up here. You can't do that in this room. You can't walk up to somebody and say, hey, you know what, I'm super struggling. I kick every dog I see. Maybe you can get away with that one. Anyway, this dude over here, I did a whole message on him. And there's also three messages that I did that was called Some Assembly Required. There's four messages that I did that I would love to re-preach right now. Will anybody give me five minutes? I can do a dentist thing. I won't do that. I'm just messing. But what, what we're, we've made this easy for you. I've took all those messages, put them together, put them on one MP3, and we're going to hand everybody in the church an MP3 of those four messages, which was on the grace groups and how important that was and why it needs to be done in your life. The scriptures say that they met in the synagogue and house to house. You can't do one or the other and do the gospel. You are either doing house to house and there's a movement for house churches and they think that they're the bee's knees and then there's a movement for just being all about the big church with the stained glass and all that. No, the scriptures are really, really, really clear that they did both. You go from house to house, you go to the churches. You go to the synagogues, you go to the highways and the byways. It, you go everywhere it is that the, if you say that the kingdom is first, then you go everywhere that the kingdom wants to be. Please rise. <laughs> if me being naked was awkward for you, it was worse for me.
Please hold out your heart by holding out your hands so I can pronounce this blessing over you. I really love being with you guys. Beloved, I pray and declare above all things that you prosper and you experience divine health to the degree that you prosper in your soul. I say this, I declare this, I pronounce this over you now in the name of Jesus Christ. If you receive that, close your hands, put it in your heart. You are part of the beloved. I have one more slide, and this will be self-explanatory. Just go, ooh.